Hello, and thank you all for joining us this evening for another Thursday evening program here with the Genealogy Center. We are glad you're here, and we're looking forward to tonight's program, which will focus on researching in UK archives uh, from abroad. Our speaker is Helen Smith. She's a speaker, researcher, and author, and has been researching family history since 1986 in Australia, England, Ireland, and Wales. And she's spoken in every state and territory in Australia and internationally as well. Um, she's written for a number of family history um, as well as scientific publications and is a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists and the Genealogical Speakers Guild. And professionally, she is a molecular epidemiologist specializing in public health microbiology. And I am going to go ahead and hand it over to her um, and we'll get started. Welcome everyone. So tonight we're talking about researching in UK archives from abroad. And this will be a little dependent upon what time period you're interested in for your research. For those of you with um, very long roots in the US, going back to the 1600s, we're not really going to be covering some of that time frames. So it's going to be a little bit more later than that. But we can do a huge amount even though we're not actually in the UK, although I strongly suggest going and visiting some of these places in person um, when you can to walk in the footsteps of where your ancestors walked and also to do some research and archives over there in person. There will always be treasures that are going to be a little bit harder to access when you're not present. There are lots and lots and lots of resources, of course, we can get. And we live in other countries and our ancestors have come from elsewhere. And this does cause us problems at times in access, but probably one of the biggest things is actually knowing what's available. And so basically we're gonna be talking about how to solve some of these issues and to move forward in our research. So, there is a huge amount online and of course we need to be looking at what is online to be able to take us to certain steps and then go back into the archives as well. So one of the few pluses of the pandemic has been there's been extra digitization projects occurring in conjunction with commercial organizations and also by the archives themselves. Um, we need to look at our archive of interests and there's so many different archives, but remembering that probably 95% of archival material pre the computer age hasn't been digitized as yet. So we need to find the rest of it. And part of that is actually knowing a bit about some of the levels of archives. Now, remember when we're talking about the United Kingdom, we're talking about the United Kingdom and Ireland. So we're talking about Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland as a separate country, the Channel Islands, Isle of Man. Now, all of these have a national archive, but they also have the county archives. They have city council archives. They have specialist archives like the Royal Physician Archives, the archive of the institutions, the Barclay Bank archives, archives of different military units. Even your local kindergarten has an archive. Okay, it might just be in a filing cabinet, but it's still an archive. So determining which archives we want and where they are and what's available does take a little bit of effort. And one of the best ways of starting anywhere when you've never been there before is to look at the Family Search Wiki because it gives some really good background information, history and geography of places around the world and what you are likely to be able to find. Because when you think about things like, when did civil registration start? Now in England, it started on the 1st of July in 1837. In Scotland, it's 1855. In Ireland, and remember, it is totally Ireland until 1922 when Northern Ireland 
um, became a separate entity. Um, it started in two different time frames with marriages in 1845 and the rest of it later in the 1850s for, for the um, Catholics and everyone else and births and deaths. Quality of the certificates and the information on them varies terrifically from place to place. Ideally have Scottish research because their certificates are brilliant. The others less so, but they're still really nice to have, particularly as many of you come from a country where some of your certificates, particularly if you're in the middle or on the Western coast, start very, very much later for civil registration. And yes, I am Australian. So at times I'm going to talk about something like civil registration, where many of you know this more as vital records. So come to the wiki first, and it gives you some information about starting out, what sort of thing, when did certain records start, what types of records are available, knowing things like the fact that until 1858 in England and Wales, wills were probated through church courts, and that can be a drama all in itself. Post 1858, um, 1st of January onwards, it is a national probate system for England and Wales. Scotland, of course, is different, as is Ireland. And yes, do have to raise that point in Ireland that in 1922, unfortunately, there were the four courts fires. So a lot of Irish records were unfortunately destroyed. However, not all records, so you can still research in Ireland. It just means you might need an occasional drink to help you along. So definitely have a look at the wiki first and then going into the once you've gone through that look in the family search catalog rather than the the indexed area because at least 80 percent if not more of what is on family search now is not name indexed um the church of jesus christ latter-day saints have been digitizing their microfilms that they are able to digitize due to copyright restrictions from the copyright holders and they are making them available some of them yes you need to look at an affiliate library for or at a family search family history center but there is huge amounts that is actually available so when you look at cornwall you can actually go through and you can see censuses, you can see all sorts of things. And then when you click further into that, you can actually look at this one, which is Cornwall Wills, which is the pre-1858 Wills. And when you look there, you can see you've got a little camera there. That means you can access it. If you've got a little key sitting above the camera, it means you're going to need to go to an affiliated library or family history family search center to be able to look at it. And there is huge amounts that are available. And yes, it is literally just like sitting there and trying to roll a microfilm, except that you're doing it digitally and you can advance that way. So a huge amount, it is actually available. So how else are we going to find archives and archival material? We can look at search engine and remember Google is not your only search engine. In fact, use Google to find other search engines. Each search engine ranks pages differently. So it is important to um, try a few different ones. And if you're looking in the UK, use the UK Google site rather than the US or Canadian Google site, because it will give some more preference to UK areas. The other thing, of course, is Cindy's List and Gen UKI, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those. So Cindy's List, as we all know, has got over 317,000 organized links. And of course, you can come in from the United Kingdom and Ireland. As you can see there, there's a range of categories, and it's also got it broken up into things like subjects like military, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, censuses, etc. When you come across the right hand side, you can see a whole range of categories that can help you. And she's got links for those. And of course, if you come across a link that's not working, because of course, that's the one thing we know about the internet is links change. And that's the other thing that the pandemic has done is so many archives redid all their websites and changed all their links drop Cindy a little note in the broken link tab and let her know about the link that's broken because that way she can help you and help all of us. This is a brilliant site for UK and Ireland genealogy. It started in March 1995, so it's like, what, 28 years old now. Uh, it is run by volunteers. 
So it has a huge amount of data on it, but some pages have more than others, um, but huge amount of great information. And it starts off at a regional level and then moves down. Now, the category headings for Gen UKI are the same category headings you're going to see on the Family Search Family History Catalogue, so they'll be quite familiar to you. So this is the general one where you're going to see uh, all those categories on each side. Now, if you get down to an individual page, parish page where some of those aren't applicable, they just won't have um, be there on the page, so it's fine. So if we then come down to England, we can then come down into the individual county. We click down into the individual county. We can then click underneath. So you can see the overarching things. You can click underneath to the parishes. Then you can click on the individual parish of interest. And then that will give you some general information about the parish. If there's someone who's particularly um, involved in that parish, you can also get some trans transcripts, other information, bibliographies. It varies from place to place, depending on how active the volunteer for those places have actually been. Yorkshire is absolutely amazing. There's something like 170,000 pages around Yorkshire stuff. So hugely thing. So you, Cornwall, there's a lot of really, really good data. I'm not going to cover these two because I'm sure that um, the Allen County Public Library has already really done a lot of work on them. But keep a look on these as well, because with Archive Grid, it's got, you can never really tell where manuscript collections particularly have ended up. The Battle Abbey um, manuscripts from Kent are in a university in the US. So it is something to really pay a great attention to. So definitely look at those. So what we've looked at Gen UKI and we've worked out that the National Archives for England is the National Archives, so TNA. So you can't forget the the. But one of the things it really, really has is um, a Find UK Archives. And then you can actually look in there and it gives you a whole range of different archives. Now, we've spoken about the point of view of a national archive and county archives and local history archives, but have a look at some of the variety of archives here. Oxford University, Tombridge Centre Library, most libraries have a local history selection. Now, this could be photographs. If you're lucky enough to people there later in the period, it can be trade directories. It can be all sorts of interesting things they've collected about their local area. BBC Written Archive Centre, oral history sections, so many different unusual archives that you don't necessarily think about. So don't necessarily just think about the big government archives. There are so many others. Would you think about a Police Federation of England and Wales, the Oxfordshire Health Archives? If you've got someone there in the 1900s, the health inspectors used to go round and then make little notations about the tanner's yard was not being kept in the best of condition and they were fined because they had created well, basically a public nuisance of themselves by having it not in good condition so it wasn't considered healthy. So this can get reported in quite great detail at times. So once we find our archive, check the catalogue. Now your major archives are going to have an online catalogue. How good that catalogue is can be quite varied. Some catalogues are really great down to a name level. Some of them basically just tell you they've got, okay, um, I'm a meters girl, um, six feet of information relating to that village. If you are lucky enough to find an archive that is catalogued down to item level, it is so much easier to send a directed query to that particular archive requesting a copy of a document if you've got the reference number from their catalog and also asking for a lookup in a specific record set. So this is the National Archives in Kew. 
their catalog is called Discovery. Now, it's got more than 32 million descriptions of records. Now, this includes the old Access to Archives catalog. The theory behind the old Access to Archives catalog was they were trying to make a one-stop shop for archival catalogs to make it easier for us, the user. Sadly, funding for that ran out and it wasn't continued, but they do have some information from over two and a half thousand archives across the country. Now, you might find some, inf and you will find some information from the Kent Archives there, but it won't be everything the Kent Archives holds. You still need to go and look at the Kent Archives. The other huge thing is that the National Archives at Kew have more than 9 million records that are available for download. Now, pre the pandemic, that was costing you between £2 and £3.50 for each record that you could download. Some of these are available on the pay sites as well. Now, due to the pandemic, they're currently free. You do need to log in and create an account, which is free, and then you are restricted to 100 downloads in a month. Now, these are things like wills, some service records, um, all sorts of different things. They're available as PDFs. How long that's actually going to continue for is unknown. So when you go in, you can see you got pop. Now, the wills in this are the Prerogative Court of Canterbury wills, Royal Navy service records, all sorts of interesting things. Some of these are getting more into the 19th and 20th century rather than earliest, but you've also got things like some of the chancery courts. So you've got a whole range of different things. Now, remembering this is something also specific, many people sort of say, well, okay, we want to know when our person left England and we're having a problem getting them on a passenger list coming into Canada or America because sometimes the passenger list really didn't start as early. Well, sadly, leaving the England, England didn't really care who left till 1890. So you're not going to get too many lists of people who left England till then. They really were a little bit more concerned about people coming in. So from about 1878, you're going to be able to find those. And remember, just because your family went across the seas doesn't mean to say they didn't go back at times. And some people, merchants, all that sort of thing, did multiple trips backwards and forwards. So the catalogue has about 30% of the archival collections indexed. Um, 418 level varies, so much level varies. Sadly, adding to that from the other archives stopped about 10 years ago. Okay, so this is some of the things. Now, I do a one name study on the surname Quested. So I just put in Quested as a keyword. And these are some of the things that I can actually see. And as you can see, now, would you be thinking about a Kent and Sharpshooters Yeomanry Museum? So this can give you some of those little tiny places which can actually have some stuff for you of interest. Now, I wouldn't suggest, of course, putting a keyword in of Smith, such as my surname. So when I delve into this a bit further, it tells me this is actually a photograph um, in 1915. So it's a World War I photograph of someone who's in my one name study. Um, Prerogative Court of Canterbury Wills, yes, you can download those. Sadly, the quality of the image isn't as good as it could be. And the pay site, the genealogist, does have a much better digitized images, but of course it is a pay site. So there's a whole range of really useful things. So this is a Prerogative Court of Canterbury Will, and yes, at the moment you can download them for free. This is the digitized version that's available on Ancestry. And yes, with a bit of effort, you can read them, which is no great dramas. The other thing they do is they hold over 9,000 kilometers of microfilm, and they've been digitizing that microfilm, and you're available to download as PDFs. Now, they're large files, so depending upon your bandwidth, you may need to be a little careful. Most of them are more than 400 megs. They're not indexed or transcribed, although there are some people doing them, and they are on a range of subjects. Things like registers of convicts, officer service indexes, border stamps, apprenticeship books, settlers and convicts to Australia. Yes, that is of interest to some of us on this 
side of the ditch. So quite a range of things. So it's worth having a look at. And they're freely downloadable. And they've been doing a lot of work on those. And they were doing work on some of those records for things like looking at temperatures on Royal Navy ships, because every day as part of the Royal Navy's requirement, they had to take the temperature of where they were. And so the scientists have been looking back at some of these to be able to do some of that. Don't forget the research guides for any place you research at. Um, some very intelligent people have spent a lot of time making the research guides to help you. And so it's really worth looking. And it gives you great information and they will tell you where else. As you can see, the 1939 register is also available at Ancestry and Find My Past. And they'll give you the history behind it and telling you about it. Things like abbreviation in Merchant Navy records can be very, very useful. The other thing the National Archives holds is the Manorial Documents Register. In England and Wales, you basically had manners. And that encompassed a certain area. And it was a historical way of doing things that if you had family in England and Wales in that earlier time frames up to 1930s in some places before some of those manners really stopped doing actively working, were all sorts of records like land, transmission of land so you can actually do genealogical research on how the land was handed down because the land was actually rented on a four generation lease and then that gives you indication of generation to generation lots of really helpful research guides most archives have a research guide so well 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 we'll start reading these huge amounts of information national library of wales there is a National Archives of Wales, but the National Library of Wales actually holds a lot of archival material that you'd normally expect to be seeing there. So they've got a lot of parish registers. They've got wills. Um, now, these are wills that were approved in the Welsh ecclesiastical courts prior to the um, 11th of Jan 1858, when the national probate system started for England and Wales. There's over 190,000 Welsh wills. You can view them for free. You do have to pay to download. But, gee, that marvellous Windows snip thing means you don't actually have to pay to download. And there's a lovely online index. They also have a large newspaper collection, including newspapers in Welsh, which I sadly can't read. But they've also got lots of newspapers in English. So lots of really good stuff. And, and this is their newspaper collection. As you can imagine, there are more newspapers in the later years when the population becomes more literate rather than in the early years. But there are some in the very early years, unless, of course, your family is quite well off. They're probably not going to be mentioned in those papers unless they're more infamous, in which case you may well have a mention. So these are the sorts of time frames where, you know, we've got some really early wills coming through this time frame. And this is the sort of quality you can see online. It's quite nice. You can't argue. So lots and lots more digitization projects occurring. Keep checking back regularly. Um, they've also got the archives and manuscripts catalog for family papers. And some of those can include wills that never went through probate. Remember, a lot of wills never went through probate because if everyone in the family was happy, it really wasn't an issue. It's only in more modern times that there's a lot more emphasis on wills going through probate. Now, you've also got lots of different family history societies that are transcribing wills. So the Oxfordshire Family History Society is doing lots of will transcriptions and they're transcribing and listing every person in the will. So every person mentioned, the witnesses, et cetera, which is really thing. And then they also have it listed as written. So this is a will from Thomas Busby of Long Coombe. And then this is the transcription of it. And then you can actually see an index, a copy as well. Public Record Office of Northern Ireland does have will calendars. And yes, sadly, we did lose a number of wills, but some digitized images of what is available um, is, of, is up there. So that's really cool. Don't forget as well for photographs and images if you've got people there in later timeframes, or even sometimes just to get a bit of a feel for what an area could have looked like from the time photography was invented, of course. 
A lot of archives are using Flickr uh, to put up images. So there's some really great collections that are up there. National Archives of Ireland um, has, of course, the censuses remembering that 1901, 1911 census um, are the only censuses that really survive in bulk for Ireland. The 1926 census um, will be out later um, because, of course, the 19, there was no 1921 census done for Ireland. The censuses pre this time frame, we did lose some in the Four Courts fire, but sadly, a lot of them were actually lost prior to that because of a snafu with government departments talking to each other. In Ireland, unlike in England, the individual householders' papers were not copied into the enumerators' books for some of the early censuses. And, but in England, it was. So when Ireland actually asked England, well, shall we uh, get rid of these um, householder schedules? England knew they had copies of the enumerators once and they'd gotten rid of their early householder schedules. And they said, yeah. Sadly, of course, this is for the 51 and 61 census. They didn't have anything else. So we lost them completely. So, yes, the 26 census hopefully will be available unknown exactly when, later, in the next couple of years anyway. So 1911. And, of course, you do have some instances of information from the pre-censuses when people were looking for the old age pension where they had to actually prove their birth because, of course, um, civil registration started a lot later in Ireland. So there's very little left, sadly. Griffith's valuation. Um, in Ireland, you do have to use a lot of other census substitutes to cover that. National records of Scotland. Um, the archives, um, Scotland was one of those, well, I'm not sure clever is the right term, but a government department that realised that genealogists really, 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 really want records. So Scotland's people encompasses um, a whole range of information from these sorts of sections. And yes, you do pay. You can search Scotland people for free, but when you want to actually view an image, you're going to pay per image. And it's not a huge amount. And the 1921 census for Scotland has just been released. Archives Hub. Now, there's heaps and heaps of, I've, I've put all the links in the handout so you don't need to scribble anything down. So this is really, really useful because it gives a lot of university archives and unusual archives. And one of the things with universities is frequently their archives get started because of an interest of someone in a particular department. And it's not always the history department. It might be something else and something started, or it may be someone who went to that university who is depositing their family collections as in papers and letters and all that sort of thing. So you can find lots of manuscript particular collections at not necessarily the county you'd expect, but because they've given it to the university they attended. So it's well worth going and having a look at that. Don't forget your family history societies. And remember, you can certainly find them by Google, but you can, of course, also look back at GenUKI, which will tell you about the family history societies and local history societies in your areas of interest. And um, poor law, and of course, remember in England and Wales, you had the old poor law pre-1834 and the new poor law post-1834 that had a real impact on how the poor were treated and how they were helped. Post-1834, you have the introduction of the poor law unions and basically the workhouses that we think of when we think of Charles Dickens and co. And they'll have all sorts of things where they've actually done work in their local area. And remember, if you have an interest and your ancestors were from a particular place and you have a query about something, Put a query in the family, local Family History Society journal. Journal editors are always looking for something, and a lot of them have an online forum. And don't forget your Facebook groups. Most of them have Facebook groups nowadays where you can actually put up these queries. I do suggest joining a Family History Society in your area of interest because a lot of them also have indexes and things available for sale, which are cheaper 
for members. They have huge, now, not all of that information might be on their website. They may not even have a website. You may actually have to just do an email or actually write a letter. Hopefully, you don't have to write too many letters to families to societies nowadays, although some of them, sadly, you do. Um, could be CD microfiche. It could be a card index that's under the secretary's bed or in their garage. Generally, there's a, a lookup fee for some things, particularly if you're a non-member, sometimes even if you're a member because societies need to earn money as well to keep running. So I do suggest concentrating your research in a particular area for a time. Do some focused research and get the most out of your journal and get the most out of your membership for that particular society in that particular area. Join for a year and then really... I'm not suggesting raping and pillaging, but close, but get the most out of it that you can. Huge amounts of stuff. This is, is publications from the Society of Genealogists, which is a national society. It's based in London. And they went through and indexed a lot of the London apprentices with the company records. So the Bowers Company, Fletcher's Company, et cetera, et cetera. And they put out these books. Now, those apprentices came from all over England. Don't forget local history. There are a lot of local history museums, local history sections in libraries, people who are interested in their local area who actually aren't interested in family history. They're in interested in perhaps the military camp in the area, windmills in the area, the canal um, systems and canal boats in the area, the railway in that area. So They've got an interest down that path, which could become of interest to you. So don't forget your specialist and your local history resources. If you've got ancestors who are involved in coal mining, the Durham Mining Museum does have an online presence, and it has things like mining, coal mining accidents that occurred in England and has quite a database of that. Um, there's a railway history societies that's actually really interested in um, accidents on the railways and they're collecting databases of that from the accident reports. Things like the archaeological societies have some of them you think about them as being getting very much more interested in prehistory and Romans and all that, but a lot of them are interested in um, industrial history, so coming up into fairly modern times as well. London Gazette was the government paper, so you also have um, the Scottish Gazette, and you also have the um, Dublin Gazette, but this had interesting stuff. So right across bankruptcies across London, if you've got people in the armed forces, um, you're going, this is where you're going to see some of the promotions and the medals and things listed in that. It can give you further avenues of research because things like bankruptcies that occur um, get listed nationally, even though it's in the county court of Devon. Don't forget the pay sites. Now, yes, there's a subscription to most of these, but you also have quite a bit of free stuff. So this is the British Newspaper Archive, which is a pay site, um, but they have um, lots and lots of newspaper pages available for free. Both Find My Past and Ancestry do have free databases on their sites. Of course, you can also access a number of these at different library systems and at family search centres. Newspapers, of course, if you're lucky enough to have people in them, is really useful and it can give you great information about the social context of the time and place. One of the other really useful things is we love universities because universities have students and over the number of years, they've done a lot of work about putting archival material available primarily for their students, but we take advantage of them. And the Proceedings of the Old Bailey is one of those where it is a transcribe of all the court records from the Old Bailey from 1674 to 1913, where effectively they did it for the history section. And it's things like you can actually search by the criminal, the crime, the witnesses, the places, all sorts of things. So it's well worth having a look. And of course, Quested is something I'm going to do. And I'm going to see a range of different crimes that actually came up. And I'm also going to have some Questeds who are the victims. And I'm going to have some Questeds who are the city police constables. So it's well worth having a look. And some of those early crimes were uh, 
quite interesting. And yes, I'll admit that one of those was mine was into forgery. But of course, remembering that some of our early criminals prior to that little contrompts you had over there that basically got rid of England, uh, they went across, a number of them went across to the US. Basically, when we start looking at the old Bailey, it was actually done from a university perspective to help their students. But of course, we've taken huge advantages of it. And as I said, I've got Quested as a one name study. So I've got Quested's here who are criminals. I've got Quested's who were victims. I have Quested's who were police constables. And I've got Quested's who were perhaps surprisingly a little bit better off in the quality, and they were actually jury members. I don't have any Quested's that were judges. So London Lives is another one where universities we can thank because they did this primarily for their students and we take advantage again. Now, that's actually an addition of two, nearly quarter of a million manuscripts from eight Archive 15 data sets and 3.35 million names. London was a gathering point. It exploded in population in the 1800s and pretty much every family has someone who was in London, maybe not necessarily direct, but there'll be siblings, there will be people in your family in London, and you can search those and that gives indications of where else to go. Google your surname. Google your places of interest. Don't forget to use the other search engines because they all rank differently. Don't forget with Google, it's not just the standard web stuff. It's also images. It's also blogs. It's also Google Scholar. We also love history students because they do things like write theses and write articles. And they're the sorts of things that can give you lots of social context and lots of information if you're lucky enough to have someone written something about something you are interested in. Online parish clerk. They're not a religious clerk. They're not family search or anything like that. They're basically obsessive people who are doing a local history study on a particular parish. Now, some counties are better equipped than others. And primarily we're seeing this in England more so than in the other countries. But they have a huge amount of information. The Cornwall Parish clerks are very, very, very active and have transcribed wills and parish registers and cemeteries and all sorts of things, directories, censuses, the whole bit. You also have like the Society for One Place Studies, Society for One Name Studies, Guild of One Name Studies, who also do specialist stuff like that. It's always worth having a look. Again, if it's Smith, don't worry so much. But if you've got an unusual name for those one name studies, definitely go and chat with them because they collect wills. As I said, I do quested and I collect questeds anytime, any place. So if you come across one, you've got my email. Um, and then they do work. So you can actually go from there, click on one of those names and you'll get taken to the family search. Now you have to sign in and all the other good stuff, but you can actually do that from there. Don't forget Internet Archive. Internet Archive has done digitized huge amounts of books that are out of copyright. And a lot of them came from US libraries, but they were books relating to England. So Fillimore's Parish Registers and Transcripts, the Registrar General's Reports, all those sorts of things you're going to find. So if you've got people from Ireland who came across during those famine years, you've got poor law union records where they're inspectors reports. Now your people may not be mentioned by name, but the social context in which they were living will be mentioned. And that's really, really important for you. Pay websites, we'll just a little bit on. Now, caveats with pay websites. They've all got similar material and they've all got different material. And depending upon, that, they may pick up something. So Find My Pass has got the 1921 census for England and Wales. They have a three-year exclusivity contract for that because they paid millions of dollars um, to get it uh, digitised and they also pay a particular fee to the National Archives for each time people use it. And this is what happens with things. They'll have, they'll have material specific to that particular pay site for a period of time. And, of course, copyright holders can withdraw access 
depending upon when contracts leave or they decide not to renew or some county archives have decided, well, if the pay sites are making money out of this, we might be able to too. So when you actually find something on the pay sites, download the image when you can, because the pay sites may lose the right to show that image. Now, they generally do their own transcriptions. So you'll still have a transcription there, but they, they often do lose rights or they decide they're not going to pay the rights, et cetera. So again, use the pay sites. There's lots of really good stuff on them. And, you know, Find My Past has some particular ones where they've got particular uh, relationships with particular archives. So Find My Past has it with the Westminster Archive, Ancestry had it with London Metropolitan Archives. Find My Past had it with the Plymouth and Devon crew. Um, Find My Past had some stuff with Dorset archives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see lots of these. So lots of stuff. So use your material on this. And if you don't have subscriptions yourself, you may be able, your local library may have it, your local university library may have it, um, your local family history society may have a subscription. The genealogist is a very much UK one. Now they've got some really interesting stuff. Um, they've been doing a lot of work with digitizing the tithe allotment work and also the Lloyd's 1910 Domesday collection, which is actually looking at individual pricing. So effectively a, a land valuation across England at that time frame, depending if you've got people there that late. My dad came out to Australia in 49, so I definitely do. Lots of duplication. Dr. Williams Library is a nonconformist archive. Um, the nonconformists weren't terribly keen on civil registration because they will prove they said we've been doing it better than that prior. So, but they're now freely available on most of the websites. Again, you can search a number of these for free, but when it comes time to actually look, then you need to pay. Finding maps. It is really important to find your people in place and know what is it about that place? Are they on a river? How far are they from the market town? What's the local transport links? So National Library of Scotland has a brilliant map collection. Of course, you've got the David Rumsey map collection over in the US, which also has international maps as well. But the National Library of Scotland has the Ordnance Survey maps for England and the other area other countries involved vision of britain has some wonderful maps cindy's list of course you can look for maps in gen uki so the national library of scotland has a whole range of different maps including side by side viewer where you can actually compare maps in the split screen viewer from the old and what's actually currently there under google earth some really really good collections and remember some of the ordnance survey maps can actually get down to like half an inch to a mile so some really really detailed stuff things like some estate maps, things like town plans and uh, directories, some really, really wonderful things. Now, we've spoken about individual archives and one of the problems is not all material is considered archival because archives run out of space. When it came time for the um, maritime Greenwich crew to actually send off all of the merchant seamen records to the National Archives, the National Archives nearly had kittens because they didn't have the amount of space required. So they did something that archivists do that family historians hate, call it a representative sample. So they collected that, which is about 10%. And then some individual sea counties that had seaports particularly so had a maritime connection they took some of the stuff relating to their area and the new and newfoundland took the rest rather than have it destroyed so the crew list index project is trying to assist people researching records of british merchant seafarers in the late 19th and early 20th century and they're trying to gather information from a whole range of archives to actually assist in this So, you no, know, all sorts of things. Lloyd's and the whole range. There's something like 150 different places they give you out links to and information to. And 
this is just clicking on C as some of the archives they've got information from and linking back into relating to this topic. And sometimes that's what you're going to have to do as well, is actually link back to multiple places to find the information you want. Be aware of the records. You've got to roadmap your records. Why was that record created? Who was it created for? Because certainly it wasn't created for us. So knowing why it was created and under what legislation it was created, it can give you some indications about how good the information contained within is. So on a marriage certificate, the, they're interested in the two people getting married and they may investigate a little on those. Um, you can fib about your dad. No one actually cared. You could say he was dead when he was just down the pub. So be aware of why a record was created and the purpose of it. And certainly the people who gave information in that record never realised we were going to come along and peer into their lives and go over it minutely. Things change over time. Legislation changes over time. Prior to the Married Women's Property Act coming into place, a married woman did not have property because she was not a legal entity in her own right that came in in different countries in different times. The other thing to be really, really aware of is, the, uh, is digitization programs frequently digitize the most used record of a record set. So for the workhouse registers, it'll be the admittance record. And generally, that's the same book that has the discharge record as well. But relating around the poor law unions and the workhouses, you've got the creed register, which was what religion you were. Now, when the new poor law started, the creed registers weren't part of it because the general assumption was everyone was actually Anglican there, so it didn't matter. So that the law on that that you had to keep a career register didn't come in for a few years later. And then whether you were nonconformist, whether you were Catholic or whatever, was recorded. So, but frequently they're not digitized. Discipline registers, every poor law union had workhouse had a discipline register. You've got the guardian board of minutes, but frequently that stuff is not digitized. So with all of your pay sites you, and any archive, that has a digitization program, see what is digitized and then roadmap your record sets to work out what other related records there are likely to be. That's where some of your research guides can be useful to give you perhaps further information. Remembering things like your friends of archives, because lots of archives in the UK, in fact, right around the world, um, are really restricted on staff opening hours and funding. So they may have other card catalogues that haven't quite indexes that haven't made it up into their online catalogue. The Friends of Archives may have done some extra indexing or they may have done and continue to do some further catalogue description work. Remember the research guides. I can't say that more often enough. There are still digitisation programs occurring. There are still work being occurred on making catalogues better, not always down to name level, which is what we'd like, but it's helpful. It's not all online. It never will be. It's not all indexed to name level. And you're going to have to index, uh, actually access by proxy or in person, even with all the other stuff. Now, email is certainly something that uh, most places can do, except remembering some of those smaller specialist archives might only have a volunteer that comes in once a week. Um, so some of those don't even have an email. You may actually have to get an envelope paper and a stamp. Professional researchers, most archives will answer short research queries. They are not there to be your researcher. So you're potentially going to need a professional. The Association of Professional Genealogists has a find a professional. And in UK and Ireland, you've got AGRA. Now, you've also got an, most archives have a list of researchers who've asked to be put on a list. Most government departments can't recommend one person over another because it's considered bias. So that's also something to consider. Join the Facebook group for the area you're interested in. Join the Local History Society or at least the Facebook for the Local History and the Family History Society for the area you're interested in and ask for someone for recommendations for a researcher. Remember, 
whether you're sending a query to the archive, to the um, Allen County Public Library or anyone else, you need to be specific in your request if you want an answer. Tell me all about my Smith family is not going to get you anywhere. Vague responses, vague queries just don't get responses or they don't get the response you actually want. You know your family. The person at the other end doesn't. They also don't need a war and peace query, which goes for five pages where they've got to read through all of that, trying to work out what you actually want. Make it easy for the person reading the query. Detail exactly what's required. There's also some Facebook groups called Random Act of Genealogical Kindness. You can do lookups in various places. And there's also exchange lookups. And so potentially you can do some of that. Archives in Britain and around the world are under threat for funding. Sadly, we're not sports people. We don't tend to get that instant funding that a lot of sports stadiums and things get. And the pandemic has been a huge expense to governments and archives were under threat long before the pandemic. Be prepared to wait for your reply. Offer to pay. In fact, most archives have got a payment schedule, but your small archives, you'll often get a better response if you do talk about payment, remembering their government records in another country, you don't pay taxes in that country. So be aware, De decreased opening hours and programs are massive. Many archives in the UK are only opening three days a week now. Researching archival material is both easier and harder now for us when we're not in that place, but it can be done. And I wish you the very best in your research. <laughs>